Support for the Capital Connection comes from United University Professions, representing 37,000 academic and professional employees at SUNY campuses and teaching hospitals across New York State. Frederick E. Cole, President, UUPinfo.org. And New York State United Teachers, representing professionals in education and healthcare, online at nysut.org. It's the Capital Connection. Hi, I'm Alan Chartok. Joining us this week is Westchester County Executive George Latimer, a Democrat. Welcome, George Latimer. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Alan, always my pleasure. Thanks. Okay. So what does a county executive do that's different from other public officials like mayor, state senator, or assembly member? Well, basically, the county executive is the chief executive uh, and responsible for the operation of whatever responsibilities fall within the county government. County governments do vary in terms of what their responsibilities are. A certain amount of duties are mandated by the state and the federal government. We run the social service system. Uh, we have responsibility for sewer treatment. Uh, we have responsibility in our county for a county jail uh, and a host of other different, you know, basic services that we do every day. They're local regional services. So the kind of things that you don't want every single town or city to have a jail. Uh, you don't want every mm. town or city to have their own sewer treatment system. So regionally, you have a county government do those things. And then over the years, different counties, Westchester, Erie, Suffolk, Nassau, we're bigger counties. We've taken on other duties and responsibilities. But, you know, it's, it's an interesting system where the local governments still have a lot of authority for zoning and planning. And the state, of course, is the, uh, is the parent government. And they sort of determine what we can and can't do. That's really interesting. You know, I grew up in Manhattan on 96th Street, but all my relatives lived in Westchester. And Westchester was big stuff. I mean, my very wealthy aunt lived in Nourishell <laughs> in a terrific house on North Avenue and moved to some very exclusive condos up at the Waikagil Golf Course. And uh, my uncle ran a drugstore on Gedney Way in White Plain. And we sure, would, well. We would go there all the time and read comic books. It was the way to do things. I asked my father once, Alan, why he moved to Westchester County. And he said two reasons. He said them very bluntly as if I'd asked the stupidest question in the world. He said, number one, it's near New York City. Number two, it's not New York City. <laughs> so... There's your suburban justification. You know, we're near the big city, which is the engine of economics and everything else, culture, arts, sports. But it has the suburban tree-lined streets and good schools and, and um, you know, all those uh, pluses to life. Yeah, you know, um, when we needed to get there, because my parents didn't drive, we took something called the Larchmont Taxi. Do you remember that? <laughs> Yeah, right at the station, right at the Larchmont train station. Oh, is that right? The Larchmont taxi, that's what it was. Okay, right. uh, so how do you get along with all these other politicians, you know, the, the assemblymen and the senator? You have to make special provisions as a um, county executive to deal with those with all of those folks. Well, you do, but, you know, Alan, I've had the, uh, the fortune in my public career, and I had had a private career, you know, working for subsidiaries of Nestle and ITT for many years. But in my public career, I've held a lot of those jobs. I've had the good fortune to serve uh, as both in the state assembly as an assemblyman and in the state senate, as well as the county legislator, chair of my county legislator, and, and I was a town ca uh, councilman in the beginning of my career. So I've had a chance to, to walk in the shoes of some of these other elected officials and understand their world and uh, be responsive to that. So many of the assembly members and the senators that represent Westchester now in Albany were colleagues of mine during my years in Albany. And I understand what they go through. I understand what their power is. I understand what some of their frustrations are. So as we craft our policies in county government, because we do need the state, the state has to authorize uh, certain things for counties to do, and they give us waivers or they don't. Uh, you know, I, I had a chance to learn the system and reach the uh, the state legislators on their terms to get as much, you know, positive results as I can. 
Uh, and then, of course, because I was a local official, I understand when a mayor comes in my office or supervisor, they have their pressures. And, and I think the, the unappreciated thing in government is that no one of us has all the power in the world, uh, unilateral power. Governor has a lot of it, but most of the rest of us, we have elements of power. And we learn how to use what power we have and what relationships we have to get the end results we want. And that's where the trick of this business is, the interpersonal relations, as well as understanding how government itself is supposed to function. Well, here's my question, uh, George Latimer. You, of course, are a successful politician. Uh, You're a Democrat. And, of course, there are people lined up behind you who would love to off you politically. I don't mean, you know, personally. (laughs) Not these days. You have to to be very careful these days with what you say. So, I mean, I know that I've had this in my life, too. You know, you're sort of looking over your shoulder and saying, that guy wants to get me. You're going to say, no, that doesn't happen. But it does, doesn't it? It does. No, it does. You know, ambition is, uh, you know, uh, goes through everything in life. I saw in my corporate career people who were ambitious, who wanted to get ahead, and you were in their way. Um, that may be true in, in the Little League or in, a, in an organization in a church where somebody wants to have the authority or the power, mm-hmm. if you will, and uh, there's competition for it. I think what has helped me over the years uh, through this career of mine is that I understand that it's all ultimately very temporary. There is, there is no guarantee mm-hmm. that you will win an election. There's no guarantee you will continue to be in office or have authority. And, and you go into these, these things understanding that there is competition so that it's not uh, – your ego is subordinate sufficiently to be effective. If you're effective, you get the better chance to stay because the voters at the end of the day will decide. But it's true there's competition at every turn, and particularly when a position opens up. Uh, you know, nature abhors a vacuum, as we both know. Mm. And uh, people immediately start moving toward that opportunity when that opportunity, you know, manifests itself. Well, I hate to go here, but I, I think I will because, uh, you know, it's always of interest to me. You know, there's always men and women in politics. And you have to be very careful because we've seen people like Andrew Cuomo and others really get politically killed because of their relationships with women. How do you handle that? Well, look, I think, it, it, you know, it's true in politics, but it's true in life. Again, I saw it in corporate America. I see it in, in, in other situations. You know, we all have, uh, you know, certain um, weaknesses in our personality. There are people I know that are terrific in so many ways, but in their interpersonal relationships with other people, they have certain weaknesses. It might be, it might be their inability to handle alcohol. It might be, you know, their relationship with people of the opposite sex. Um, and you have to try to remember that uh, we are humans. We are subject to temptations and to mistakes, and we all make mistakes. You know, if I lose my temper, uh, it doesn't look like the nice, calm George Latimer when you hear me just upset in the moment and I say words that I shouldn't say. Um, and you have to try to remember that when you're in public office, you're on a stage. It's not as prominent a stage as if you were a movie star in Hollywood, but it's a stage nonetheless. And people are watching all the time. And when just when you think that you're untouchable is exactly when you'll make the fatal mistake. And talented people have uh, either hurt themselves or lost their career over making that, that fatal mistake. And you, it's hard. You know, I have a weight problem. You know, weight problem isn't on the same magnitude as certain other types of addictions. But i got to deal with it every day. Every day I have to avoid eating things that will send me in the wrong direction. And, and you, have to, you have to try every day. Wow. That's interesting. As the county executive, you cut the property tax levy by uh, $7 million, I think, and say you still fully funded county departments. How are you able to do that? Well, you know, keeping in mind that county property taxes is one of a number of revenue streams, and, and obviously there's an expense side of the budget as well. We have, and this is maybe true of a number of other uh, governments as well, we have had, as the economy has improved, with uh, an improvement in sales tax revenue. And Westchester County now relies more on sales tax revenue than on county property tax revenue. If the economic activity is strong or stronger than was anticipated, then we have revenue without having to raise the actual rate. Uh, People buy things because they want to. They pay uh, a sales tax number in Westchester that's comparable to the counties around us, and that generates revenue that doesn't require us then to raise property taxes. We have reduced the size of county government workforce. We're down a couple hundred spots from where we were when I took office. 
Uh, we've been able to find other revenue streams, some of them fairly small, but we figured out how to negotiate with Airbnb for uh, payment in lieu of taxes. Uh, we came up with a way to generate money by uh, going off the grid in periods of high demand and got some revenue for it. And then we also have some very talented people uh, who have renegotiated certain contracts. You say $20 million on a reauthorization of a bus contract. This stuff is so in the weeds, Alan, that mm. even people in government find it uninteresting. But it's in those details that you save some money, you find some other revenue, and uh, you're able, therefore, not to have to raise property taxes. And we're fortunate now. We've gone three years. I've got a budget coming up in 23 that I think will be similar, where we've been able to have uh, you know small-grade property tax cuts at a time when people say, oh, Democrats, all they want to do is raise taxes. Well, it's not true in Westchester, and it's not true in a lot of other places. But, but that symbolism hangs around the party and, and creates a political dynamic, even when the facts on the ground are that we've actually cut property taxes in Westchester. The midterm elections are less than a week away now, and it seems like Republicans have gained some momentum, but it comes down to turnout. You spoke about early voting early this week, which began over the weekend. Give us a sense of turnout in Westchester County and whether it's representative of what you think is going to be happening. Well, Westchester County uh, has embraced early voting uh, at a level that um, I think most of the counties have not yet embraced. We, at the present time, uh, as we're speaking today, we've seen results for the first four days of early voting. More people have voted early in Westchester than in the Bronx. Westchester's got a million people. The Bronx is about a million four. Uh, Our numbers are close to Queens, and Queens has two points. Um, you know, and we're outpacing, you know, most of the larger counties. Now, if you get a very small county, they may have a higher percentage. But um, the, the bottom line is uh, we put up 23 different locations for early voting all across Westchester County, so it's kind of easy to get to. You can vote at any one of those locations. Uh, the available times involve two two consecutive weekends, Saturdays and Sundays. Mm. We have a couple of nights we go to 8 o'clock, so we've made it convenient, and I think that helps. We have some competitive races in the county, primarily in the northern part of our county, uh, with a congressional race that we're a part of, the uh, CD17 race, Sean Patrick Maloney and Mike Lawler. And, uh, that's Who's going to win that one? Well, I'm going to say Sean Patrick Maloney. It's a close race. Uh, the district is uh, the northern portion of Westchester. It's all of Putnam and all of Rockland. And Putnam's a solidly Republican county. Um, Westchester County is going to generate some good Democratic numbers. But Rockland's a swing area. And it has a block vote. So I think what everybody's watching is how's the block vote going to go and how's Rockland going to go as the swing county between the three. But I think uh, I think Maloney's going to win. Lawl is a very, uh, very tough opponent. Uh, He was a chief aide to Rob Astorino. And I ran against Rob five years ago. Mike was part of that campaign. And, you know, he's a very capable candidate. So I don't underestimate him. I think Sean Patrick Maloney's going to win that one. Let me ask you this. You mentioned early voting. And I wondered, is early voting generally good for Democrats? I think it is. Um, you know, the, the, the sense that, uh, you know, people have is that they have to work voting uh, around a single day, uh, which they have to be available for. And now that has been broadened. You, you can, quote, unquote, make a plan to vote. So you can say, well, you know, the where I work and how I work makes it hard for me to get to vote on Tuesdays. You must remember those of us downstate, many of us commute into the city. I did for many years. And if you get hung up at your if you're planning to vote when you come home from work and you get hung up at the office on a matter of importance, you miss voting or you get sent out of town in a corporate you know, career and you can't vote the last minute. You can't get an absentee ballot the last minute. Now, with early voting, you have options and you can vote if you if you're free that Sunday, you can vote, you know, in advance. And so I think that helps us in a county like ours uh, get some get some folks out there. There's still, however, let's be honest, a major disconnect between a large amount of people and the political process. They find it boring. They don't know who the candidates are. They don't understand uh, what's at stake, and, uh, and they don't vote. And no matter how, many, how easy you make it for people, there's still a significant portion of our population that's just turned off. And, and that's much deeper than making voting easily available. That's more about how they view democracy and, and how they view government and politics. We're talking to Westchester County Executive George Latimer, who is a Democrat. So, George Latimer, you're a Democrat. You've got a major job. You're the head of a county, basically, your political head. What's next for you? 
Well, you know, always the, the, the classic question. I am uh, at the tender age this month of 69 years of age. Sheesh. And uh, I am, uh, Such you know, a kid. I'm, I'm a baby to some. Yeah, I'm a baby to some, and I'm ancient to others. Uh, uh, this, uh, this responsibility in this office will last another three years. I am term limited by my own hand. I drafted the bill to uh, uh, keep Westchester County executive to two terms, and I uh, had it apply to me, not just to my successors. So three years hence, God willing, uh, I'll leave off the age 72. Well, that's not that's not too old to give up everything, but, you know, that's not always the time to uh, launch a campaign for something. We'll see what happens. I'm sure I'm going to be involved in a productive way. It could be in the private sector, in the not-for-profit sector. Uh, maybe it's in the media. Alan, who knows? Yeah, that'd be great. We'd, let, we'd welcome you, and it would be great if uh, you ran for governor. Speaking of which, what's your sense of who will come out on top in New York, gubernatorial race between Kathy Hochul and Lee Zeldin. I take it you think Kathy Hochul will prevail. I do. Uh, I think it is, it's a much closer race than was originally predicted. And uh, I have to credit the fact that the Republicans, the campaign, not just for governor, but elsewhere, they've done a very good job of positioning a couple of key issues. And, and in fairness, you know, many Democrats uh, did not recognize that these were key issues early enough on in the process. Uh, and those would be the issues of the economic impact uh, of what's happening in the society with inflation and the potential recession and the fear of crime. Now, in Westchester County, crime is down when you compare 2022 to 2017. But the fear of crime mm. is framed by what they see on television. And they see some an incident of an horrific crime, and it, it could be somewhere else. It could be in Chicago. It could be in New York City. It could be anywhere. It's not in your backyard. But you fear it now. And you believe that one party is soft on crime and the other party is tough on crime. So credit the Republicans for positioning themselves that well. As a Democrat, we fully funded the police and we have a very aggressive crime fighting effort. But, you know, uh, that doesn't break through the media. So I think on, on the broader positioning, the Republicans have made all of these races much more competitive by marketing themselves very well. And some of the other issues that are on the table, such as, you know, uh, denying that the election of 2020 was a legitimate election and uh, propagating a big lie, and the insurrection of January 6th, those stories, which are important stories, have not gotten the same attention by the electorate when they're thinking about their pocketbook and whether they're safe. However, with all of that, uh, there are far more Democrats in New York than there are Republicans. I think Kathy Hochul is, uh, uh, is seen as a positive figure. She's a, a, a different type of person, uh, not just the first woman, but much more low-key, much more friendly to deal with. And I think she's going to wind up winning. But it is a close race and a competitive race. I think uh, the Democrats are worried, rightfully so, about holding the House of Representatives. Uh, I don't know that we will. And I tend to think that it's going to take some good luck mm. for us to do that. The, Senate, the U.S. Senate's up for grabs. As much as I read about it, it could go either way. Um, and I do think we're heading to lose some seats in both houses of the state legislature. I think Democrats will maintain control in both houses. But uh, there's some people I know, good people, that are going to uh, lose. Some of it is attributable to the redistricting plan, which we've talked about, you've yep. talked about, yep. with a lot of guests. Uh, and that redistricting plan <clears throat> that was imposed by the mapmaker out of Pittsburgh – uh, created uh, a whole different world of New York politics. So let's talk a little bit about something that is very unpleasant, and that is physical attacks on politicians. Have you ever been threatened? Has anybody ever come after you? Have you ever gotten a phone call which threatened you or your family? This is not a good sign. It's true. I've gotten a few uh, threats. I don't know how credible they were. Uh, when you get a threat in the mail, um, you know, that's at one level of concern uh, when you get a threat where somebody looks like they want to rumble with you in person. Yeah. I must say, Alan, you may be able to relate to this, too. When I was a younger man. Yes, I'm quite uh, a fighter. If, in, if somebody got in my grill, I would kind of like get back in their grill. You know, yeah. it, didn't, it didn't bother me to go face to face with somebody in my 20s, or right. teens. But now where I'm at in my age, I may have the, uh, you know, the desire to get, you know, to get uh, you know, right back at somebody, but right. you can't do it. I, I can't back it up. So uh, it, I have to, uh, I have to show some, uh, you know, appropriate adult behavior. And there are people yeah. who provoke you with provocative uh -oh. language, with a potential threat. I haven't faced anything like Paul Pelosi did, but I do think what's happened to the society is that uh, people who hold extreme views. It's true on the far left, but it's very true on the far right. 
that they're reaching a point at which they're prepared to do physical violence to accomplish their end. They're not content that the ballot box will decide that perhaps the bullet box will decide. And I do worry about that. Uh, I don't worry about it as much personally, uh, but I do think that uh, there are people that are being ginned up on purpose to be aggressive in a way that is inappropriate in a small d democracy instead of just disagree with them. And that can lead to personal violence. So the big issue of the midterm seems to be inflation, economy, and crime for the Republicans and abortion and the threat to democracy for the Democrats. Are you concerned uh, issues like crime and rising prices will move independence to the Republican side of the aisle? Well, you know, we tried, and I'm you know, speaking in the micro of my home county and the messaging we're doing on our county policies. We're not on the ballot this year. But we've dealt with all four of those issues. We never thought that it was either this or that. Um, we've addressed uh, economy. We talked about this in an earlier interview where we suspended bus fares and we've cut taxes and we, uh, we now have lifted sales tax on uh, home energy heating for the vote because we recognize it's an economic problem. We made the point of highlighting that we're fully funding police and corrections and probation because we recognize there's a fear of crime. And the way to address it is not with rhetoric, but with professional policing and corrections and so forth. And we also have stood up for women's right to choose and then also stood up against this uh, anti uh, uh, democracy movement that's coming where people want totalitarianism. So we think all four of the issues are valid and all four of them should be emphasized. Where we have failed individually in, or in certain jurisdictions to talk about crime and inflation is where we have some you know, issues now electorally because it is on people's minds. And you can't take away the fact that the economic issue is universal. A woman's right to choose is an important right. It does not affect every single person in the society. The economics affects every single person in the society. Yeah. You can't afford to talk about a couple of issues. You've got to talk about them all and not just talk about them, but have an actual game plan of what you're going to do about it. And I think that, you know, in the next we're talking, you know, not quite a week before the election. There's still time for the Democratic messaging to be more substantive on all of those issues and give us the best possible chance for a result on Election Day. So now on the Environmental Bond Act, your office has been reminding Westchester County residents to flip over their ballots and vote on Proposition 1, assuming you want them to vote yes. Why? And how would the Bond Act help Westchester County? Well, first off, we've been very careful about government resources being used to inform the people that there is a Bond Act, as opposed to uh, advocacy to vote for the Bond Act, which I do on my own dime. Uh, as a public official, the board of, our board of legislators and many of the Westchester municipalities have endorsed the Bond Act, but we keep that very clear in mind that what government can do and should do versus what you do individually. Uh, we think the Bond Act is essential. It's a $4.2 billion, uh, frankly, pool of money that can be used for all different types of environmental actions, things that harden our resistance to flooding, things that restore shorelines. Uh, things that ensure clean drinking water with, you know, pipes and things that are important, uh, electrifying our bus fleet and creating more electric vehicle charging stations. All of those projects, including those that affect uh, people in urban settings and Westchester and um, the communities of Westchester, as, as many others, will, you know, come to the state with projects and say we could use X amount of dollars from that will keep us greener and cleaner. And, uh, and the good jobs that come from it. So we think it's an essential step forward. We also learned a big lesson, Alan, from a year ago. Mm. Now, so I'm running for re-election as county executive. I don't have a lot of bandwidth to do other things. But there were uh, voter uh, reforms that were on the ballot, and there was not a cohesive effort to promote them, and there was a very effective effort to defeat them. Now, they carried in Westchester, but they failed statewide. And I think we in Westchester understood we couldn't let that happen again to the Environmental Bond Act. We got out there early. The advocates were out there. We, we've done a lot of things to inform as well as advocate. And I expect the Bond Act to pass this year, and I expect that to be a productive use of spending because we're not wasting it on temporary things. We're using it to build things that are going to last over time. I want to go back to COVID. Are COVID booster shots getting put into the arms of Westchester residents? Flu shots, too. What is the responsibility of a politician like yourself to make that happen? Well, first off, uh, it is a function of the county health department to uh, provide vaccinations, and we, we have both flu and COVID vaccinations. We also did a very aggressive monkeypox vaccination mm -hmm. campaign when that was uh, on the headlines. It's now uh, 
uh, seems to be receding as a concern. Uh, I even, you know, I even got uh, shot in each arm a month and a half ago with a bivalent booster and one arm shot in the other arm. I'm of an age where I should be getting shot every year. So we try to set the right standard. Westchester has had a good uh, a record of vaccination without mandating to anybody. We've hit 85 percent of our population vaccinated. And I think it's been shown in our COVID numbers. We were the first outbreak in West in New York State. New Rochelle, I remember. Yeah. Right. For the last five, six months, we've been pretty much the same level of uh, active cases, same level of um, people who are hospitalized and at a, at a manageable level, under 10 percent hospitalization. So I think we're doing pretty well. Now, around the corner is another variant. What do I know? I'm not a man of science. We'll react to whatever happens. But I think we've been practical and pragmatic, and we've gotten a good result by being practical and pragmatic. And it is our responsibility. We get help, big help from the state, but it's our responsibility to get that public health message out there. We're out of time. It's unbelievable. Every time I start to talk to you, George, new things come into my mind and I decide, well, I'll ask them about this and that. You can always ask people about sex because, you know, everybody who's listening to the radio will be very interested in what anybody has to say about that. (laughs) (laughs) But... But we do thank you for joining us. It's always wonderful to talk to you. And I must say, uh, you have a tough job. And uh, it may not sound that way to people who are listening to the radio, but it's a tough job. And you have to make a lot of crucial decisions. And we thank you so much for making them and for being with us here on the Capital Connection. Alan, it's always a pleasure. Look forward to speaking to you again. The Capital Connection is a production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio. For copies, call 1-800-323-9262 or visit us online anytime at wamc.org or just schedule a podcast anywhere you get your podcast. And join us again next week at this same time for another political conversation. Thanks for listening. <laughs>